What do we mean when we say woke Bible verses? How should Bible verses be interpreted? The core teaching of both Christianity and Judaism is simple. Love your neighbor as yourself and love God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. All else is commentary. St. Augustine teaches us that all of scripture should be interpreted with its twofold love of God and neighbor in mind. That if the literal meaning of scripture seems to conflict with this twofold love of God, then it should be interpreted allegorically. One excellent example of reading the Bible allegorically is the verse in Psalm 137, where the Jews are encouraged to bash the brains of Babylonian babies against the rocks. So how do you interpret this allegorically? Well, the church fathers equate these babies with our small sins. That we should strive to be perfect, even as our Heavenly Father is perfect, bashing both our large and small sins. And this psalm describes the frustration of the Jews as they're being driven to exile in Babylon. And we must keep in mind that the Psalms are prayers like prayers prayed by real people. Sometimes they contain thoughts that are not truths, but rather strivings, and thoughts that may even seem hateful on their surface, but often not always. These thoughts represent spiritual struggles that sometimes are resolved later in the Psalm. Unfortunately, we're often tempted, like the Jews driven to exile in Babylon, sometimes by fear, sometimes by hate, to not view our threatening neighbor as real people to view compassion towards our undeserving neighbor as somehow woke. And C.S. Lewis, in his work, Reflections on the Psalms, agrees with this method of interpreting the Psalms. He points out that there are multiple Psalms that he calls the cursing Psalms, where the Psalmist utters thoughts that sound unchristian or even hateful and vengeful, and he agrees that these should be read allegorically. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video. Please feel free to follow along in the PowerPoint script we uploaded to SlideShare. Please, we welcome interesting questions and comments together. Let us learn and reflect together. There are two versions of Jesus' most memorable sermon. The Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, which begins with, Blessed are the poor in spirit. And the Sermon on the Plain in Luke, which begins, Blessed are you poor. And most commentators from ancient times to modern times prefer the Matthew version because who really believes that the poor are blessed? Does this mean the poor are better than us? And there's often a difference between the exegetical approach of the church fathers and the Jewish rabbis. When two differing versions of the scriptures appear to conflict, Christians are often compelled to harmonize the versions so there's a unitary message. But the Jewish rabbis often conclude that there are simply two different messages. Our approach is to reflect on whatever interpretation brings us closer to God and our neighbor, and to reflect on the many possible interpretations of the scripture. And quite often there are multiple interpretations. So perhaps when the Jesus in Luke says, Blessed are you poor, perhaps that is the exact meaning of the verse. And this is the first paired couplet. Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. But woe to you that are rich, for you have received your consolation. What does Jesus in Luke mean when he says, Blessed are you poor? Perhaps one answer is the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, only told by Jesus and Luke. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, full of sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. Now, of course, the parable goes on to say that Abraham informs a rich man, now eternally poor, that it is impossible for Lazarus to cross the chasm and relieve the thirst of the rich man. But one amazing part of the story is the rich man knows the name of Lazarus. Perhaps he talked to Lazarus when he gave him scraps from his table. Perhaps he is the only one in the family who ventured outside to take care of him. Now he asks that Lazarus do him a small favor. Maybe he thought he was a friend of Lazarus, and this interpretation is frightening. It suggests that throwing crumbs at the poor is not enough. You must instead truly help them. However, in their commentaries, St. Jerome and St. Cyril of Alexandria speculate that the rich man did not share his crumbs with Lazarus ignoring him as he went to and fro. But then how did the rich man know his name? And if Lazarus was not fed at all, why did he not crawl to someone else's gate? 
But these saints do point out that the rich man has no name in the parable. Lazarus' name is mentioned because he's blessed in heaven, while the rich man is eternally tormented. And St. Augustine teaches us that Lazarus' name is written in heaven. Now, rarely will I push back on patristic commentary, but in this instance, my interpretation is actually stricter than the church fathers, so perhaps it's okay. In case we doubt that Jesus and Luke truly believes that the poor are blessed, the next set of couplets only confirms this. Blessed are you that hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Woe to you that are full now, for you shall hunger. And indeed, the rich man does hunger now, but spiritually he was also hungry when feasting in his father's house. And remember when Jesus, after fasting for forty days, was tempted, and the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. In Matthew, Jesus exhorts that we should hunger and thirst for righteousness. And the next set of couplets exhort us, Blessed are you that weep now, for you shall laugh. Woe to you that laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. And we're reminded of the parable of the Good Samaritan, where the traveling Samaritan notices the poor man whom thieves have robbed him of all that he had, beaten him and left him for dead. And how the Good Samaritan took care of him and comforted the stranger. Now among the church fathers, St. Ambrose teaches us, Blessed are the poor. Not all the poor are blessed, for poverty is neutral. The poor can either be good or evil unless he's the blessed pauper described in Proverbs. And a righteous poor man is better than a rich liar. Blessed is the poor man in whom the prince of this world finds nothing. Blessed is the poor man who is like that poor man, although he was rich, became poor for our sake. And that refers to Jesus in Second Corinthians. Luther's contemporary Philip Melanchthon teaches us that Luke begins with poverty because it is the commonest misery of the pious. Both wealth and poverty are ordained by God. Neither on account of wealth nor on account of poverty is a person accepted or rejected. But to use wealth correctly is a good work, and to use poverty correctly is also a good work. Do the poor by their poverty merit the kingdom of heaven? No. Instead, because they've already been made sons and heirs, and the kingdom of heaven is also compensation for their poverty. What does the kingdom of heaven signify? Not only future glory, but also universal divine defense in this life. John Calvin teaches us, God does not prohibit the rich from his kingdom. If they do not become snares to themselves and do not fix their hopes on earth, thereby closing up the entrance of heaven to themselves. And the Anabaptist John Walpott teaches that by the poor, Luke does not mean that those who have nothing on account of laziness, or those who have wasted, gambled, or drunk up their wealth, or even those who have nothing and yet are as corrupt as anyone else. Instead, he's speaking of those whom the Spirit makes poor. For just as the Spirit drove Christ into the desert when the devil tempted him, so also the Spirit drives the poor into poverty, so they have nothing of their own, just like Christ, their Master. Those are the poor in spirit. St. John Chrysostom teaches us that neglecting to feed the poor is a type of theft. If you cannot remember everything instead of everything, I beg you, remember this without fail, that not to share your own wealth with the poor is theft from the poor and deprivation of their means of life. We do not possess our own wealth, but theirs. If we have this attitude, we will certainly offer our money. And by nourishing Christ in poverty here and laying up great profit hereafter, we will be able to attain the good things which are to come. Now, does God help those who help themselves? Where does this verse appear in the Bible? In polls, Dr. Wikipedia reports that over half of American Christians believe that this verse is indeed in the Bible, although it is not. The Bible exhorts us to love our neighbor, to take care of our neighbor. The Bible does not exhort us to tell our neighbor that he has to take care of himself. Dr. Wikipedia does list many verses that encourage us to work diligently to support our family. And a half a dozen of these verses are from Proverbs, which is not surprising, since the book of Proverbs offers many practical sayings and life advice. Now, what is the least understood verse in the Bible? Perhaps this verse from 2 Thessalonians is the least understood. For when we were with you, we gave you this command. If anyone will not work, let him not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. Now, we shouldn't simply memorize Bible verses in isolation. We should always reflect on the verses and chapters before and after the current verse, and indeed the entire book, and then the entire Bible, to determine the true meaning of the verse in context. Now, in the first book on Thessalonians, St. Paul discussed the imminent coming of the Lord. But some in the community were counting on this coming a bit too much, quitting their jobs and causing problems in the community. And we'll quote from the conservative Baptist Broadman commentary. Due to their confusion as to the time of the Lord's return, some Thessalonians, thinking it would be immediately, 
had stopped working. They had become idle troublemakers. Paul ordered his readers to keep away from any brother who is living in idleness, contrary to Paul's tradition. As Paul himself had set an example of continuing to work as a tent maker when he was visiting the community, so they would not need to support him. Now this is a favorite verse of many Christians, but it's one of the few verses that discourage helping those in need. I know of no other verse containing the instruction, if anyone will not work, let him not eat. And here the Thessalonians not working were waiting for the kingdom of heaven. And since it has not yet come, they had a long way ahead of them. In contrast, there are dozens of Bible verses that encourage almsgiving, both in the Old and New Testament, which are listed in several web pages. Almsgiving is celebrated in the story of the first Gentile baptized as a Christian in the book of Acts, a Roman centurion named Cornelius. Luke tells us in Acts that at Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms liberally to the people, and prayed constantly to God. And Cornelius said to Peter, Four days ago about this hour I was keeping the ninth hour of prayer in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright apparel, saying, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. Now is almsgiving simply a work, or is it an act of faith? Many Protestants seem to believe that the Reformation introduced the debate between faith and works, and justification by faith. But this has been debated by believers since early in the history of the church. Venerable B teaches us that Cornelius had faith. His prayers and alms pleased God. And by his good deeds, he earned the right to know God perfectly and to believe in the mystery of the incarnation of his only begotten Son, so that he might approach the sacrament of baptism. Therefore, through faith he came to works, yet through works he was strengthened in faith. Likewise, St. John Chrysostom teaches us, Look how great the virtue of alms. We seek the virtues that are the most salutary for our salvation. Such is almsgiving and such is prayer. Prayer becomes efficacious as a result of almsgiving. And he continues, Cornelius was a soldier with no instruction, who was tangled up in the affairs of this life, who had each day a thousand things to distract him and bother him. Yet he did not waste his life in banquets and drinking and gluttony, but spent his time in prayer and almsgiving. Now Martin Luther said that he thought James was an epistle of straw, since it seemed to contradict his extreme emphasis that we are saved by God solely through grace, that our good works do not advance our salvation. Indeed, this verse in James exhorts us to help our poorer neighbor. If a brother and sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill yet you do not supply their bodily needs. What's good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. So what does the Bible say about the poor? Many people have this mistaken notion that prophets in the Old Testament predicted what would happen in the future. This is totally mistaken. The Old Testament prophets preached that God would withdraw his blessings from the Jewish nation if they did not take care of the poor, the widows, the orphans, the sojourners, and the immigrants. The prophet Isaiah exhorts, Lo to those who decree iniquitous decrees, and the writers who keep writing oppression to turn aside the needy from justice, and to rob the poor of my people of their right, that widows may be their spoil, and that they may make the fatherless their prey. When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. The prophet Zechariah exhorts, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Render true judgments. Show kindness and mercy each to his brother. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor. And let none of you devise evil against his brother in your heart. And the prophet Jeremiah warns us. For if you truly amend your ways in your doings, if you truly execute justice with one another, and if you do not oppress the alien, the fatherless, or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after gods to your own hurt, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave of old to your fathers forever. And the prophet Malachi likewise warns us, Then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I shall be a swift witness against those who oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the orphan, against those who thrust aside the sojourners and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Which means that the prophet Malachi is a supporter of a living minimum wage. These are only sampling of Bible verses mentioning widows and orphans and the poor, Nearly all the prophets, including Micah, Amos, and Zephaniah. Various web pages list over a hundred such verses in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. What does the Bible say about immigrants? In the Bible, sojourners are immigrants, and the only difference between them is the ancient world did not require passports. 
When God gifted the Ten Commandments to the Jewish nation, it was with this exhortation. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And a few chapters later, he exhorts, You shall not wrong or oppress a resident alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. There are over 80 verses where God reminds the Jews that he brought them out of the land of Egypt, and a dozen verses where he brought them out of slavery, and other verses where God reminds them they were aliens in the land of Egypt. And many of the verses we've already quoted exhort us to be kind of both the poor and the sojourner, or immigrant. Many people thought that Jeff Sessions misused the scriptures when he quoted Romans 13 to justify Trump's immigration policy. Quoting from the New York Times, Many were concerned that Mr. Sessions' chosen chapter, Romans 13, had been commonly used to defend slavery and oppose the American Revolution. Mr. Sessions had said, I would cite you to the Apostle Paul in this clear and wise command in Romans 13 to obey the laws of the government because God has ordained the government for his purposes. Now outside the United States, this passage was used by Christians in Europe to defend Nazi rule and by white religious conservatives in South Africa to defend apartheid and to defend the Jim Crow legal system in the Deep South. And a reporter had asked Sarah Huckabee Sanders, the White House press secretary, where does it say in the Bible that it's moral to take children away from their mothers? And Sanders said that it is biblical for a government to enforce the law. This is actually repeated a number of times throughout the Bible, she said. Now, we recently heard in the news that Florida Governor Ron DeSantis' and staff deceived Venezuelan immigrants that they would be provided housing and jobs and relocation assistance. Instead, not only were they dumped at the Martha's Vineyard Airport without warning the government authorities, they even scheduled immigration court hearings in other states that they would likely miss. Now, how can anyone say this was not viciously cruel? Perhaps the cruelty is the point. If you only watch Fox News, you are unaware of the effect this article has had in liberal circles. That for Republicans, the cruelty is the point. And since most Christians are Republicans, and since most Christians view the Republican Party as the Christian Party, that means that most of our secular citizens who are turned off by organized religion do not view American Christians as compassionate. They view Christians as cruel. For many Americans, cruelty, not compassion, currently defines Christianity. But personally, I am sympathetic to many of the so-called Christian issues, but I'm reluctant to support them. Why is that? because so many Christians wish to show cruelty rather than compassion to their poorer neighbors. Now, God loves immigrants, particularly poor immigrants. We know this because an entire book of the Bible tells the story of a young poor immigrant, Ruth, who marries Boaz so she and her mother-in-law, Naomi, can escape poverty. And these slides are from our reflections on St. Augustine and the Stoic philosopher Rufus. There are a few truly happy marriages in the Old Testament. One shining example is the marriage of Ruth and Boaz. Naomi and her husband moved from Judea to Moab to escape a famine. Their two sons married two Moabite women, but over the years she became destitute when first her husband, then one son, then a second son, all died. Naomi, in desperation, decided to move back to Judea, although she had lost touch with her relatives and her homeland. She tells her daughter-in-laws to stay and remarry local men, but Ruth, showing character, refuses to leave Naomi. Ruth said to Naomi, Do not press me to leave you or turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. And this is one of the most touching verses of the Bible. This loving verse shows Ruth's devotion to her mother-in-law, her future devotion to Boaz, whom she will wed, her devotion to her God, and how her love for her family and her love for God intertwine in her heart. And Jewish law states that when farmers harvest their grain, they must leave behind sheaves of grain so those who are destitute can glean the grain. Boaz notices the graceful beauty of Ruth as she gleans in the fields and instructs his workers to leave behind extra sheaves of grain for Ruth to glean. To truly understand the story, we must remember that the ancient Hebrews saw the Moabite women as somewhat loose. So, perhaps in a sense, she would have been seen by some in Israel as an illegal alien, especially since her mother-in-law abandoned Israel to move to Moab, marrying her sons to Moabite women. Personally, I have trouble labeling those who seek a better life in America as illegal aliens. Doesn't the poem on the base of the Statue of Liberty read? 
Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these the homeless tempest toss to me. I will lift my lamp beside the golden door. Now, of course, there are some bad apples, and there are a few Americans who are members of gangs, and there are a few illegal aliens who are likewise members of drug cartels. But the large majority of immigrants, legal or otherwise, are law-abiding and hard-working. Many immigrants flee from countries where gangs make life dangerous, or they wish to escape grinding, unending poverty. How can we blame those who seek a better life for their families? And also, when will we grant citizenship, or at least a promise that one day they will not be deported, to the dreamer youths whose parents immigrated years ago, for whom America is the only country that they remember. And in our video on our channel philosophy, I discover further many topics covered here, mainly how to live a godly life in modern America. Now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. We consulted the ancient Christian commentaries on the Church Fathers, and also the Reformation commentaries. Both of these series are from InterVarsity Press, I prefer the classical commentaries that quote extensively from the church fathers and the preachers over the modern commentaries written by one or a few people or by a committee. C.S. Lewis wrote Reflections on the Psalms, which reflect how the church fathers read the Psalms allegorically, although he doesn't mention the church fathers in particular. We also consulted the conservative Baptist Broadman commentary. This is an older 1971 version I picked up many years ago in a used bookstore. And we also have videos and book reviews of the works of the apostolic church fathers and also the Torah and Talmud commentaries by the medieval and modern Jewish rabbis. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the Meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.